All right, y'all, no intro today. We're just gonna go ahead and get into it. I do wanna let you all know, we're gonna be covering some heavy topics. I wanna talk about the red pill and the manosphere and how that ideology can go into personal relationships and end up being quite destructive in ways I didn't even know about. I also wanna talk about how I think this is infiltrating the BDSM community, how people with this ideology are shifting their language to use common kink phrases and labels and I want us to all be aware of that and look out for it before it takes root in more of our spaces. And if for some reason you don't know what I'm talking about at all, we're gonna start from the very beginning, we're gonna be going over all the basics you need to know, and then we're gonna get into a specific example of this. And if you have been living under a rock as well and you truly do not know what is going on, the Manosphere has exploded in notoriety over the last year especially. It went from being a relatively niche thing that people knew about, it was a known quantity but not mainstream, to suddenly being the subject of international reporting. Thanks to people like Andrew Tate that at one point overtook social media. They were the most talked about person on YouTube and TikTok and Twitter and everywhere. Went all over mainstream news and they haven't been heard from quite as much since. But even though Andrew Tate is currently a little bit more quiet than they used to be, there are still people that are riding that wave and making a big impact here on YouTube. There have always been Manosphere content creators on YouTube since the very beginning, as far as I can tell. But they have really taken off in recent months. People like Fresh and Fit or Sneeko or just Pearly Things, they have either started a career or revitalized an old career thanks to red pill ideology. And they're spreading the ideology to a brand new group of people that haven't heard about it before mostly young folk. They weren't around when Neil Strauss's The Game was first being published. And when I say that their audiences contain a lot of young people, I do mean young. According to reporting from outlets like The Guardian, as well as viral social media posts too, many of the people that are now talking about this are 12 year olds just bringing it up on the playground or in their classrooms. And they don't see any shame in that. They don't see any reason to not talk about it in broad daylight out in public. That is concerning. And I know some people will go, okay, wait, back it up here. You are overreacting. You're taking this way too far. What is all the fuss about? We have seen moral panics before. This is just like video games. We all panicked that, oh, the video games are gonna turn people into killers and they're gonna turn their brains into Swiss cheese all the video games late at night and obviously that didn't end up happening but I do think there is a difference between this and other moral panics like video games like the satanic panic because we have actually seen real world terrible violent outcomes because of manosphere and red pill beliefs there have already been terrible acts that have happened, they have been documented, and I believe they will likely continue to happen. Which is why it's so important that we be aware of what these communities are doing, where they're going, and where they are trying to hide. I believe some people are cynically trying to shift their language to being more like BDSM language and adopting it because it gives them a safe place to hide because they can go, oh, well, you're just kink shaming me. Oh, you don't understand because this is just kink. Even when it's really not because the spotlight has been on their existing language for too long and they can't keep saying what they used to say because now we're all aware of it. And so they have to shift to talking about something else. And they have long used other communities, other online spaces, even memes to hide what they really mean. So we shouldn't be shocked if this is where they're going. And I have noticed on YouTube for a while now that when you search for dominant man or submissive woman or how to be dominant or what is BDSM, if you do that, if you sort by newest, a lot of the most recent uploaders are Manosphere channels, not kink educators, not sex educators, not anyone that you think would be talking about this. And there's a couple of reasons I think for why this happens. I think 
It can happen because you run out of topics. A lot of pickup artist people on YouTube, they've been on the platform for a very long time, and there's only so many videos you can make about cold approaches or whatever it is that they call it. You run out of subject matter, you gotta move on to something else. Also, I think a lot of people just do this as a pure naked grift. They see a lot of money in this. They know that people think that kink is some kind of mysterious, mystical art that only the most elite can truly understand. And so naturally they are drawn to learning about it, even with a high price tag from somebody who shares their own worldview. And so there are people that talk about kink and then they go, hey, go to my website, sign up for my free email list, big red flag there. And then lo and behold, they send out an ad and that ad says, hey, I am evaluating people to invite to my exclusive intensive in Croatia next month. And you might be one of the lucky people I select that are good enough to be part of this once in a lifetime experience. And then the person gets on the call and then they quickly discover, oh, okay, this is a $20,000 experience and I also have to pay for my own airfare. This can have a really big payout for people like this. So of course, if they can make that money even from one or two people, it ends up being worth it for them. But as I've already said, it's sometimes not about the grift. It's not about the money. It's not about not having other content to make. It's because some people perniciously, especially online outside of YouTube, they understand their clock is ticking. They got to find a new place to go. And the kink community, they think aligns with some of their ideology. They think DS, is in line with believing in alpha and beta males because obviously alpha males are naturally dominant and women are biologically programmed to be submissive and society ruins them and makes them not submissive anymore. And you can train any woman to be submissive because that's her natural state that she secretly wants to be in. And you know, what are femdoms, I guess, but they have a worldview that is not aligned with mine, that I don't agree with, I don't have time right now to dissect people that think that you are biologically predisposed to be one thing or the other based on your gender or on your sex at birth, but that'll be a subject maybe for another time. But I just wanna make sure people are aware of this because I have tried to talk about this before. I made a video a couple of months ago, maybe a year ago, where I talked about one specific creator that I believe was a pickup artist and they were selling very expensive courses that were giving dangerous misinformation about BDSM in them. And I wanted to have that be more known about, but of course, because of the way that individual advertised their classes, that video very quickly got completely demonetized, age gated and never really saw the light of day. And so not very many people know about this. So instead we're gonna be talking about this one in a very general way. And then going over some particular examples that I wanna tease apart here. And before I get too ahead of myself, I'm just gonna back up for a second and go over some basic terminology. Talk about some groups you're gonna wanna know about as well as some terms and phrases you're gonna hear in this video. If you wanna go into more detail, other videos from much better creators than me will be linked down below. And we're just gonna do a very surface level overview to make sure we're all on the same page. If you already know about this, Feel free to skip ahead to the next chapter if you want to. But for those of you who don't, let's talk about the basics. So what is the manosphere? The manosphere is a blanket term used to refer to a set of related ideologies that all share a similar worldview. Typically, this worldview includes misogyny as well as anti-feminist and anti-SJW beliefs. Usually they also want to strive towards a return to so-called traditional masculinity. What they mean by traditional varies. That could be ancient Greece, that could be ancient Rome, it could be the 1950s, or sometimes all of the above and then some more. They argue that men are the real victims of society, that they have been shafted and their needs have been made secondary, such as the need for physical intimacy. 
you can maybe start to see a path of where this is potentially going. But the manosphere contains many, many groups within it, and some of them are more acceptable than others, at least as far as broad society is concerned. One of those groups would be fathers' rights activists. That sounds pretty nice on the surface. You know, fathers do have rights. They want to see their kids. That's good. And they generally believe that they want men to have an equal say in custody. They want there to be an equal distribution of child time between divorced spouses. And that seems fine, right? Right? Where, where could this go wrong? Well, for example, a lot of people that are in this movement also promote using something called parental alienation as an argument in court that is very disputed and likely is used to hide some pretty nasty things in parent-child relationships. A lot of these people also want to be able to have what is called a, and I hate this term, but I have to say it, a financial abortion. And on the opposite side of that coin, a lot of them also want would-be fathers to be able to have an equal say in the termination of a pregnancy. Again, you can maybe start to see how some of this is potentially valid, but a lot of it could end up being misused when put in the wrong hands. And so just even on that very most top level of acceptability, there are things to be concerned about. Going deeper down that spectrum into less acceptable territory, we have the pickup artists. And pickup artists are an interesting group because a lot of people like to laugh at them, but there is a danger that lurks below the surface. If you don't know about pickup artists, they are basically people that make kissing as many women and getting as many phone numbers as possible into a sport. They are the kind of person that thinks collecting as many notches in a bedpost as possible is the goal of being human. And yeah, it is funny to laugh at somebody that puts everything in their life into getting as many kisses as possible. Like, oh, I got 1,000 kisses. I've had a success rate of, you know, 10 out of 100 women want my phone number. Like, it's funny because it's like your whole life is about what? Like, why would you do that? But even though it might sound silly, some of their ideas have spread into the rest of the manosphere and it's gone into much more dangerous territory. Like for example, they believe in something called last minute resistance or LMR. That is a term used by PUAs and yes, there are a lot of acronyms here. They love their acronyms, so I'm sorry, but it is something they do. And LMR basically refers to the belief that women seemingly out of nowhere will just get cold feet right before you get to actual intercourse. And they see it as nonsensical based in slut shaming or internalized stigma. And they give people advice for how to overcome this resistance. That generally doesn't square with a robust view of consent, at least in my belief system. And the last group you need to know about is the Red Pillars. You probably already know where they got their name. It's from that scene in the Matrix and oh, the red pill awakens you to the truth and the blue pill keeps you sleeping and unaware. And they like to take terminology from a movie written by two trans women, even though a lot of them are very much anti-trans and like, it's funny, but they do it. And they refer to themselves as red pillars because they believe that they have awoken to the truth of society and male-female relationships. They believe that feminism is destroying society. They believe that male privilege doesn't exist. And they also believe that women act on something called hypergamy. And hypergamy is the belief that women seek out relationships, especially intimate relationships with men that are of a higher status than them. They don't really talk about men doing this. They seem to think that only women are really doing this. And so this leads them to believe that women are fundamentally deceptive, that they are untrustworthy, that they cheat, that they lie, that basically you can't believe a word that comes out of their mouth even when they tell you they're not doing this because of a phrase, a Walt or all women are like that. They use that as 
basically a thought terminating cliche they can use whenever they're starting to feel like, oh, maybe women are complex creatures. No, all women are like that. All women do this. Whenever they can find a reinforcing belief, see, that is proof of AWOL. That is proof of our worldview being correct. And to go back to hypergamy for a second and all of this, they also believe in something called sexual market value. And they believe that men's sexual market value increases over time as a man gets wealth and acumen in his career. And they believe that women's sexual market value goes down over time because they see youth and thus fertility as the pinnacle of female existence. And oh, the only reason why you'd really need a woman is because you want to reproduce and have children. That's really what everyone secretly cares about subconsciously because of their biological drive. And usually this belief is based on the outdated notion that women hit the wall at around their late 20s or early 30s even, because of the fact that they think that women's fertility falls off a cliff at 35 most of the time. That isn't actually true. That's a really outdated notion. It's not really that cut and dry, set in stone. Fertility has a lot of factors to it, but they think this justifies their natural inclination towards very young people, as in girls, as in just in and around puberty age, because, well, we're biologically programmed to want to join with the most fertile people possible, and that's obviously going to be very, very young people. I mean, they are very bold about this belief. They see no irony in it. Go to my video about age gap relationships. I didn't even talk about any of this stuff in that video. And they still swamped me with comments about, you know, it's just the natural order. Men want nubile young women. And it's like, oh, okay. Slow down for a second. Don't need to get into all of that, but they did. And so that is just some background on the manosphere. Some key things to know. And now we're gonna get into a specific example that really worried me. And believe it or not, this all starts over on Reddit. And Reddit has always been a popular place for controversial groups and opinions. And I would like to believe they have cleaned things up over the years, but you can be the judge of that for yourself. And there was a subreddit that was called r slash the red pill. And they were very upfront about their beliefs. There's a whole other interesting story about how that subreddit was apparently started by a state legislator. And that is fascinating. Read about that if you want to. But the red pill was very popular. But eventually, they flew too close to the sun, they melted their wings, and they got quarantined by Reddit. Quarantined doesn't mean deleted from the site. It just means harder to interact with. You can still find the red pill. People still post on it. According to the numbers I saw, they have millions of people that are still on that Reddit, and also that they have at any given time hundreds of thousands of active members. That is obviously concerning. Now they are harder to find on just the mainstream regular Reddit, but they are still on there. There is another more mainstream group that came out, I think, after the red pill, and that would be r slash purple pill debate. And they sell themselves as a more neutral place where people who are both blue pillars and red pillars can come together to debate in the marketplace of ideas and come to a correct centrist view of the world. And I just... I feel like there's videos that talk about this, about like how the merits of debate don't apply when you're dealing with such levels of extremism because it only really lets bad ideology out into the world more publicly and to some extent validates it as being worthwhile to talk about. But again, this is just a whole can of worms. We could keep going forever and I could talk about that, but we're not going to. And because there are still places on Reddit where you can talk about this ideology, there are naturally other places that talk about people talking about this ideology in just a broader view. They bring these other posts, they put them on their own subreddit, and then they talk about it. And one place where this happens is yet another subreddit called r slash 
not how girls work. And it's a sort of antidote to this AWALT idea. They talk about people that don't really understand how being a girl works. It's in the title, it's right there. And they shared a post that I thought was very interesting. And I did some digging and I could not find the original post. So there is a non-zero chance this is a doctored post. I don't believe it is, but it could be. So reserve judgment if you want to based on that. Based on the tags and the little like quarantined thing at the top, I believe this came from the original Red Pill subreddit that got quarantined. And it's a doozy and they use BDSM language in it and it's very concerning and I wanna talk about it in more detail because I think this is a great just little nugget of what I have been seeing happening on social media, on YouTube, on Reddit and I just want to go through all of it and dissect it line by line. I'm going to do my best to not get anywhere near kink shaming. So just have faith and hold on. So let's start with the first part of the post. Title, Dread Game Causing My Girlfriend's Mental Health to Spiral? Dot dot dot. Too far? TLDR, went too far with Dread Game. Girlfriend's mental health spiraling. Yes, I effed up need softer ways to maintain influence over the dynamic. I recently made a post detailing how I implemented Dread Game, educating you guys on what my understanding of it is and what my observations were. So to start off, I am a human lie detector when it comes to female BS. I continued to implement Dread because I felt like she was hiding too many lies about her past in order to control how I perceive her and influence how I treat her every suspicion was correct and i held zero judgment i'm not out here to shame i just want her to be my s and no one else's i want to understand her so i can understand what her needs are and how she can meet mine without all the charades i have value i deserve truth no less i'm like no one else the first time I read this, the title alone was concerning, but I actually facepalmed when I got to the part where it said, I am a human lie detector when it comes to female BS. Like, uh, first of all, I don't know if you know what you're saying about yourself, but then also like, no, you're not. If like what you mean is is i can sense all of their lies and i know everything and i just i get all of it and they can't get anything past me like slow down buddy that is not what is happening here like this is just the perfect storm of self-aggrandizing and self-deception all together and i just i want to go through how this is wrong because this really bothers me and i think this is an important thing to break down so let's start with the fact that even highly trained police officers are only as effective as chance at guessing if they are being deceived or not. A review of the literature from 2020 on the science of deception detection outlines this very thoroughly. It can even be said there are times where they are worse than chance, including because of confirmation bias. Isn't that fun? You know, AKA the entire thing that outlines red pill ideology and things like a Walt and is sort of how the whole thing keeps going. And even outside of maybe high stakes environments like a police interrogation, let's step back from the high stakes world of all of that and just talk about, you know, people talking to each other, flirting with each other. How accurate are we at guessing when that's happening? Well, as it turns out, not very accurate. For example, there was a study done by the University of Kansas where it was shown that only 36% of men were able to accurately judge when they were being flirted with. Of course, they were more accurate with being able to tell when they weren't being flirted with, but that is a very low number. So why would you assume that you are so much better than average to where you are better than trained cops at being able to detect lies like 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 what grounds do you have for this just like the feeling of like i i think i'm right so therefore i am if anything 
if you believe that you're always going to be able to tell lies from truth, you're gonna miss a lot of lies and mistake the truth for a lie, I think more often than not. I think another potential influence is the presence of body language analysis and how that has become very popular on YouTube, especially following the Johnny Depp Amber Heard trial. It was something that a lot of people noticed and then took stock in as being 100% totally true. I have to admit, I used to like watching that kind of content. There was one creator I used to watch that I thought was pretty good at it, that seemed to really couch everything they said and a lot of caveats and disclaimers. And I liked it because it was entertaining to me the same way reading an astrology reading is entertaining to me. Like it was like a fun thought experiment, but maybe not super real. I didn't realize how many people were taking in these videos and then training themselves and then believing they were body language experts or journeymen maybe and they just all thought they were little mini Cal Lightmans from Lie to Me. Like, I, don't, it's Cal, I think it's Cal Lightman. I don't remember that show very well. I didn't watch too much of it. But like, they just think, ah, oh, I've, I've done this on YouTube. I can spot all these lies. And it's not really that concrete of a science, despite what some people on YouTube might lead you to believe. And of course, this all gives you a false sense of confidence, and that goes along really well with PUA and red pill ideology. And then there's also the good old fashioned Dunning-Kruger effect. And of course that is not without its detractors and criticisms, but I think it could potentially help explain some of what is happening here because they know a little bit. They like there there are little teeny tiny little bits of kernels of truth in some things that some PUAs, red pill, manosphere content creators will say. And they'll learn a little bit and they think, ah, I know a whole lot. And they get really confident in their ability to discern what is happening. And they think they are better at it than other people when in reality, they're maybe actually worse than average because of how much their own bias blinds them to what is truly going on. So there's a lot of reasons why this doesn't work, but there's one reason why it kind of does that I think is unintentional. And that's because lie detectors themselves are kind of also BS. They can show certain things. I'm not gonna go into the full history of lie detectors right now and polygraphs and all of that. Lie detectors are not admissible in court and we have known about the issues with relying on them for two decades at this point. So yeah, maybe you are right in saying you're like a lie detector and that you are not the be all end all and you have problems with your ability to truly analyze what's happening. So yeah, uh, maybe that is something that is accurate in your statement here, but I just wanted to really go through all that because when I see people being so boldly confident like that, I'm like, are you really? Are you are you sure about that? Like, are you really sure about that? And I also want to say, you know, the whole oh, but no judgment thing is so funny because like, I mean, we don't really know, right? We weren't there in the room. I have trouble believing it was genuinely no judgment based on what else we hear in this story. But yeah, okay, so you were going for a no judgment approach. But instead of like giving your partner a safe space to feel safe in, to tell their truth, you made it a high stakes dread scenario where you drew it out of them. You coerced them probably to tell you the truth. I have trouble believing that there is no judgment in that because if there's no judgment, why is it so high stakes to get all this information in the first place? But moving on, Let's talk about part two here. I got what I wanted. And at the end of it all, when I got to the center of the truth, I felt we were in a better place truly knowing each other. Knowing her truth also helped eliminate my jealousy. It also helped with internalizing AWALT. Well, it worked, but too well. I assumed that my dread game wasn't soft enough and the hard dread game is taking its toll. I was warned about this that if all you've got is hard dread, it's just gonna cause more relationship problems, even if it's a great short-term solution. Luckily, I do have very desirable long-term traits that cement my value in this relationship. The unfortunate part is that it's triggered her hidden abandonment issues. I've suspected a decline in her mental health over the past few weeks. She doesn't shower as much, doesn't clean her room as much. Her hair is always messy. 
She confirmed this to me one night when she broke down finally and opened up to me about it. Knowing her truth also helped eliminate my jealousy and helped with internalizing a Walt. And, oh boy, that is just another way of saying I looked for things that would confirm my worldview and I kept digging until I did. And then when I found it, and then when I contorted things to fit that, I said, ha, I told you so. Brilliant investigation going on there. But there is one thing in here that I do want to talk about because I think it's something that a lot of people fall for regardless of their ideology. A lot of people think that knowing everything will eliminate their jealousy for good, kaput, bam, bye. Does that actually do that? Does that really help eliminate jealousy? And if it doesn't, what would actually help with that? Now, I am somebody who's polyamorous and I have multiple relationships and basically day one, learning about polyamory, any podcast, any book, any conversation, jealousy is the first topic. It is what everyone wants to know about in polyamory. It comes up a lot. So naturally, I have had a lot of information about jealousy tested in my real life as well as shoved down my throat anytime polyamory comes up. So I consider myself to be pretty versed in all of this. And as it turns out, in general, trying to eliminate privacy, interrogate your partner about everything they're doing and get to the bottom of the truth as though that is a thing that objectively exists, that is not actually really going to solve your underlying problem. It's a good temporary solve for yourself, but it doesn't fix the root problem because the root problem isn't whatever your girlfriend did or did not do. It's you. It's your core beliefs. And this is something that's difficult for a lot of people to process. I get it. A lot of people's first instincts in polyamory are, ha ha, I won't feel jealous anymore if you tell me everything about every day you go on as soon as you come home in great detail. Or I won't feel jealous anymore if you tell me about every single one of your past boyfriends in order and you tell me how good they were in bed and how I compare to them. Once we go through all of that, smooth sailing, right? Smooth sailing, please? No, that is not how that works, unfortunately. This generally just ends up fueling more rumination. It makes people feel worse because the doubt will start to creep back in. Again, you haven't solved the problems. The cracks are still there. Water is gonna keep dripping down through the cracks onto your head. And you're gonna think, okay, well, you know, I know about the, you know, the fact that she told me all of her past partners, but what about their size? What about how long they could last for? What about how experienced they were? What about how they kiss? There's always going to be something new you don't know about your partner. Unless you are literally in their head 24 seven, there is always going to be something left unsaid by your partner. That is not them lying to you. That, like, unless they had a running transcript of every thought they had in their head, you're never going to know everything. People forget. Memories get fuzzy over time. No matter how hard you push, you might not know everything all the time forever, which is why just trying to drill down into this doesn't really work. You're not gonna know everything and it's not really actually gonna help. It's just gonna give you more particular things to worry about. Instead, professionals like counselor Kathleen Labriola recommend interrogating your own core beliefs. What do you think about things like this and how could that be contributing to your own feelings of jealousy, especially when they're totally out of scope and quite extreme? That is something that would be very difficult for a red pillar to accept because the core beliefs they would have to interrogate would be things like a waltz or just believing in the manosphere beliefs they have all together. Like you would have to do a lot of what essentially amounts to deconstruction to be able to resolve all of this because of how much their belief system is based in not being able to trust women at their word. The solution, at least to me, involves things like healing your own attachment wounds because you probably have them if you're a red pillar. 
just finding security and safety in yourself instead of mining through your partner to try to get security out of them. And also people like Kathy recommend doing things like treating your jealousy as a sort of phobia and going more on a phobia treatment route. And I'm not a mental health professional. I don't know how valid that is, but from my own intuition, I can understand how that would work because if you are dealing with really intense jealousy, that is usually based in fear of loss, fear of abandonment, fear of having your self-esteem being crushed. There's a lot of fear and anxiety bundled up in that. So treating it like a phobia could be a way of untangling all that, resolving it and holding those feelings a little bit more softly. It's not like you're trying to totally eliminate feelings of jealousy. They're going to happen. I'm not saying you should go the other direction and like get rid of all of your feelings altogether because I don't believe in that. But you can just not let them control your whole relationship and then lead you to controlling your girlfriend with what essentially amounts to mental abuse, you know? So <laughs> that is something that I think we need to address. Also, one other thing we need to address here, abandonment issues. He says in this, oh, you know, this really brought out her hidden abandonment issues. Did it though? Did it? Cause like, do we actually know that she had abandonment issues before dating you or not? Because there is a stark difference between activating past trauma and the memory of that and actively traumatizing your partner right now in the present moment. This is how people that are mentally well, that have healthy attachment styles, this is how they end up getting sucked into very toxic relationships because this can happen to anybody. You don't just have to have pre-existing issues to be vulnerable to this. Everyone is vulnerable to this kind of bad behavior. Also, this brilliant human lie detector made the very astute observation that a decline in self-care behaviors could potentially be linked to a mental health issue or current mental health crisis. What a genius, wow, what a guy. Isn't she so lucky? No, she is not, and there's a very distinct reason why. So, at this point, you're probably wondering, Evie, why haven't you talked about Dread Game? What the actual heck is Dread Game? What is that about? That sounds really messed up. And I didn't know about Dread Game before I started to research for making this video. I didn't know what it was. And I consider myself to be pretty educated on this topic. What I found? was very disturbing. It is a sick thing that some people do intentionally to try to control their partner. And it is upsetting to hear about. So just warning for that now, buckle up. What is dread game? In their own words, they say that dread is putting the fear or dread in your wife that you have other opportunities and other options rather than being chained to her whims. And this is usually recommended as a series of steps that you do in a married relationship when there is a dead bedroom. The steps are usually between like six and 12 or so, depending on what source you go to. And they essentially rely on activating your partner's fear of abandonment on purpose to get them to do what you want them to do in the relationship. Usually, in the case of red pillars, that means putting out more or putting out again if there's been a lull in the relationship and they feel totally justified in doing this. To be a little bit fair, just to have a shred of charitability, I will say that some of the earlier steps are not terrible. A lot of them involve helping yourself as a person first, you know, going to the gym, developing healthy habits, reading books, just doing things to get hobbies and be more interesting. And they will attribute success after doing these more basic steps to the fear of abandonment being activated because, oh, she realizes you're gonna have better options because look how much better you are, how you're improving yourself as opposed to like, wow, you're a more interesting person. You're not just online all the time reading red pill forums constantly. Like when you are interesting, people get more interested. When you have hobbies, when you work on yourself, people like that because it makes you better and more fun to interact with. But that is 
too complicated of an idea for some people to grasp, I suppose. But quickly, when you start going down the levels into more about this game, because they think that everyone operates with some kind of level of dread in their relationship, it gets worse. It goes from self-improvement to outright psychological manipulation fairly fast. Writers advocate for people to act indifferent and emotionally withdraw if they aren't getting what they want, aka physical intimacy. They tell you to flirt on purpose with other women in front of your partner. Make her feel replaceable, basically. Give her ultimatums, say in plain and detached ways that you'll end the relationship. Remind her that her clock is ticking and she's losing value, subtly, if she hasn't already, depending on how old you are. A few contributors as well, though, are a little bit more bold with their approach. They instruct you to wear her down with fights on purpose, just for the sake of it, about nothing. They tell you to ignore her on purpose, don't read her messages, don't answer her calls, disappear without notice for days on end with no explanation. The final step, often left unsaid, is to sprinkle faux-loving behavior between these acts compliments, gifts, and listening to her. Not because you actually want to or care about her. Oh no, no. You do this because it gets you what you want. Because a little bit of sugar with the poison helps it go down more easily. And without realizing it, they have almost to a T described love bombing and the cycle of relationship abuse. And they do it on purpose to manipulate people in a coordinated way. And that is unbelievably disturbing. I don't know how to explain it any other way. It just is, oh, like you want to get what you want out of somebody? Just like extract it from them by any means necessary. Don't treat them like a person with thoughts or feelings or mental health. No, no, no. They exist only for you. Like, I feel almost this sense of empathy with people who believe this and do this because, and this comes across as cynical, but I, I mean this genuinely, like, who, who hurt you? What deep attachment wound and loss must you have in yourself to treat other people like this? Like, they don't matter. To believe concretely, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that Everyone else is playing the game that you're playing, and you were just too much of a sucker to not see it earlier. I can be here all day talking about how other people don't do this, and they don't act like this in relationships, and they simply won't believe it. It won't matter. And it's it's awful, and I, I feel bad because it's like, I guess you haven't ever really felt what unconditional love is. But also, I know people like this that are incels, like that talk about this, and they have perfectly normal families, and they have normal family lives, and they just kind of get here on their own. So it's not always just that they're hurt people hurting people, at least not because of something somebody else has done to them. It's more complicated, but, you know, it's there. So they do this all on purpose, and it's very disturbing. So let's go ahead and get into the next part of this post. It took me a minute to empathize because of a lot of her typical, unattractive female BS. The type of stuff that confirms red pill truths has made me feel a little cold towards her. When I go cold, that means I basically lose all my emotions and I start making everything into a joke, especially if she's upset and opening up about her feelings. Being cold feels like a good thing when you seek power over a woman, but at the end of the day, I don't need to actually hurt anyone over love. Or, great, she's obsessed with me, but now her sex drive is starting to die again the last two days because she has been secretly terrorized by the thought of me leaving her and that she'll never find someone like me again. I'm obviously toning this down and appealing to a more reassuring daddy energy when she has these moments, and I'm trusting in an overall assertiveness whenever she is acting up. I love taming brats but destroying her mental health just to aggrandize my ego is not really worth it to me. When she broke down and told me all this, it did make me rethink what I'm doing. Maybe I'm being a bit too extreme when it comes to triggering that fear of loss. I thought this was something 
that died when Tumblr became a lot less popular, but I guess it's still out there. The whole, oh, I went cold and I felt nothing. That, like, that sounds like something you would say if you were about to say, I'm gonna go sicko mode, or somebody who's like a really big fan of Patrick Bateman trying to get his energy or something. Like it's just, it's so bizarre. But when you actually stop and think about it, it's not actually that bizarre because this is really a more extreme version of what a lot of people talk about happening and I'm no psychologist and I'm not going to say I'm an expert on anything related to mental health but either this sounds like it's an intentional power play which I think is what he's trying to make it sound like he's doing like ah I just went totally cold on her and I don't care what she thinks at all or it could actually be that he's maybe experiencing a form of disassociation through emotional numbing. And if he has a lack of emotional regulation skills, it wouldn't surprise me at all that when he is dealing with an emotionally activated partner, as she probably would be, that triggers his defenses. And he suddenly goes, oh, well, I, I can't handle this. This isn't safe to be around. And then he shuts down emotionally in response to that to keep himself safe because being around other people's feelings at all, if they're in any way negative, feels dangerous. A lot of people deal with this. A lot of people just do not learn how to sit with other people's emotions and they feel very threatened by them. And so they go into shutdown mode when they're around them because being totally numbed out and blunting those emotions is way easier than actually having to be comforting and deal with them in a productive way. And this is not healthy for long-term relationships. Like you can't just every single time your partner has a strong feeling, you can't just emotionally detach. That's not gonna work. That's like, if there is something going on there that needs to be addressed, it's going to make it worse. It's not helping anything. Like you're not helping yourself. Like you need to like, honestly, all this post just makes me go like, you need to work on yourself and not like that. Put down, put down the game, put down the weights. Okay, get, like just pause and like maybe do some therapy instead for a little while. Maybe we can pick up a different book besides like The Art of War, maybe <laughs> do that instead, I don't know. And it's really sad because it also seems like this isn't subtle. He only really cares because it's, damaging the amount of times they have sex and her sex drive. And if you read through the instruction guides for how to do Dread Game, the goal is always to get to sex. That like, I don't even think they care about getting anything else to be honest, other than just like an ego boost and like being more well regarded by other red pill guys. Like they just all think, ah, if I do this, like I'm gonna get sex. And then when, Instead, their girlfriend spends all day locked in their bedroom crying. They go, but you were supposed to suck my... Why do you... What? No! This was... It's like they, they panic because they're, it backfires on them. And it's like, yeah, it's almost like if you mentally torture someone, they're not going to want to sleep with you. I know that is counter to your whole the thing you think explains the world, but in actual reality, it turns out doing this doesn't actually make people horny despite whatever your posts tell you is reality like of course like like no like and some people will react to frankly abuse like this by going through a period of hypersexuality of trying to soothe the relationship with sex but that is not a universal given or something that you should really even be pursuing as like a nice bonus for you anyway. Like, talk about treating your partners as disposable, but this is when we get into the BDSM language. So I do wanna talk about that because I think it is something that it needs to be highlighted. Like, a uh, daddy is canceled, sorry, no, sorry. People who use daddy in a relationship, you get grandfathered in, you can keep doing that. Uh, from this point forward though, I'm gonna need to have a full and complete shutdown on all new daddies until we can figure out what's going on here. Cause the more I hear the word daddy being used, the more suspect I am that the wrong people have found this term and are using it in very much the wrong way. 
because from his description, I don't get the sense of some kind of like benevolent caring energy to me. What instantly came to mind for me is something called transactional analysis. And I don't really know how many other people know about this. It's not like super niche or anything. It's a realm of psychology that attempts to explain how people interact with each other via different ego states. And the theory goes essentially, this is a very, again, not a psychologist, this is a very brief overview, I could be wrong, but essentially how this explains interactions is we each have three different ego states that we can occupy. We can be in our parent ego, our adult ego and our child ego. And our parent and child egos essentially come out when we are having interactions that prompt us to get into that state. And they are something that is based on our early life interactions, basically from five years old and below, roughly. Our adult ego state is something that develops in the here and now. That's who we are right now. However, with all of this, it gets complicated. They can be expressed in healthy and unhealthy ways. Like you could have a communication where you're acting from parent ego and it can be positive. And you can also be acting from child ego and have it be negative. Like it's again, complicated. This is a very quick summary here. But what it sounds like to me based on the description of what he's talking about doing and what we know about what happens during Dread Game, you'd be acting probably from a place of like a parent ego where you're very authoritative, you're very controlling, very demanding, the more negative parent ego state where you are essentially triggering that over and over and over again to get your partner to go into a child ego state. And there's a specific version of it that's called the adapted child ego. And essentially what that is, is uh, you end up expressing things like moodiness and defensiveness and anxiety, even apathy because you are trying to basically alter your behavior to make your parent happy with you and to avert their ire and avert their criticism. And it can make people feel really bad. And it, it's not fun to be in that state in a conversation, let alone as something that is continually brought up in a relationship over and over and over again, to be in that state of not feeling good enough, of feeling like you're gonna be thrown away and abandoned, you know? Like it's something that can be related to childhood trauma and memories, yes, if we dealt with that in childhood, but even for people that had healthy childhoods, you can still go to that place if your partner in conversation is often enough getting into that place of critical, authoritative, just mean parent ego. Okay, so again, very complicated. I don't even know if I really explained that one super well, but to me, that's what I'm seeing. Not really a loving daddy state. Again, it more goes back to maybe almost that love bombing. Oh, pretend to care about her. So she'll do things to you sexually that you want. Like that's more what it resembles. It feels like the carrot to the stick. Like, oh, we're going to be nice to you now. and I'm going to be protecting and loving partially so you can't identify me as the source of your problems, but also so you're distracted when I beat you with a stick later. So you have to think about me as like, oh no, no, he's not just a bad guy. You know, he's nice to me and he cares about me and he does this for me. Like the fact this is so intentional is so disturbing to me. And I shouldn't even have to say this, but we're gonna say it. Uh, that's not breath taming, not even a little bit. And this one is very easy to debunk because breath taming has to be what? Consensual. Yes, class, this all has to be consensual. And so if you are messing with your partner's mind and then that causes them to act out or react because that's what happens when you experience abuse, that's not breath taming. That wasn't consensual. That's not really what this is all about, a partner reacting to abuse is not the same thing as being a brat because when you are being abused in your mind it can feel like you are drowning you know that something is wrong but you're so lost in you just you're scrambling you're like oh i gotta be able to breathe again like what's happening here and that can cause you to lash out and hurt people unintentionally or act in like bratty ways but it's because you're so desperate, because you know something is wrong and you're trying to escape from it, but you can't because your partner is 
pushing your head under the water. It sucks. It, it, like, I, it, saying it sucks doesn't even cover it, but I feel like I can't use the language I want to use on YouTube to describe this. But I, I really, really hope that he hasn't told her she's acting like a brat. I can see a scenario where part of this dread game is he ignores her. He doesn't pay attention to her. She acts upset. She notices that he's going to the gym a lot and is ignoring her and is flirting with people in front of her. And she thinks, I'm never going to have love like this again. I'm going to be totally alone. You know, I'm 28. I'm running out of time, like he says. And then when I act out to get his attention or when I say, hey, can we talk? And I, I try to spend time with him and he shuts me down. Like he says, I'm being a brat. Maybe I am a brat. Maybe that, maybe that explains all of this. It's not him, it's me. The people that are in the thick of it, sometimes it can be easier to believe you're the problem than your partner being the problem. And the source of your pain, especially, it's very hard. When you care about someone, when you love them, it is so hard to see them as being the problem because you want to believe they're good. You want to believe they're like you. You want to believe you have the same values. But red pillars like this, unless they're with another red pillar, I guess, they don't have the same views. They don't care about you. That is why dehumanizing women is like core step number one in all of this. Because you have to see them as separate from yourself and not worthy of empathy, only worthy of being taken from, of being a source of extraction. So that way you can get your needs met. And that's it. Anyways, I didn't, that wasn't even in the notes I wrote. I just went off on that and... Okay, we have a whole other part to do, so we should probably do that because I can tell them my battery is running out of power and it went dark and, okay, so just, this is wrong and I hate it, but we have one little bit here left, okay, and then we'll wrap things up. I don't want to give her even more attention or validation. I feel like she should have to earn it, not beg for it. A small part of me thinks it's some test, some last minute resistance of some sort, her feminine frame countering mine in a way but the spiral in her mental health is undeniable. She's going to work in unwashed clothes. It just feels like I'm heavily bordering on psychological abuse. The thing is, I'm just not sure more reassurance is the answer. What are some other ways that are more soft and subtle that can help me maintain influence over the relationship? What attention? What validation are you, I mean, maybe it's on the post, but I'm not seeing a whole lot of it here. You're not affirming her feelings. You're not listening to her. You're patronizing her, not comforting her, and you're treating her like an object. You can paint a veneer over that as much as you want. You can pretend you're not really doing that, but anything else you're giving her is a false premise. It's a facade. It's not based on you really caring about her seemingly, at least, at least the guides or anything to go by. If you want to actually validate her, you got to change what you're doing because this is not how validation works. And lots of people are afraid of validation. They're afraid that validation is permission giving and enabling, and it's not that. Validation is just about recognizing that somebody is experiencing an emotion and not about telling them that they're feeling the wrong thing. A lot of people think that if you acknowledge somebody is sad, that will enable them to feel sad or angry or whatever. It's not like that. As far as I can tell, not even the most basic kind of validation is happening in this post or in this relationship. And then <laughs> he thinks it is some kind of last minute resistance before she completely submits to him in body and mind that she is having this mental health crisis. Like, talk about needing to break a submissive. Jesus Christ, this is the most toxic possible version of that. Like, in his brain, he's thinking, oh, like, I'm so close to her giving in to me, but she hasn't yet, and this is an impediment to her doing that. So um, how can I be more soft to lead her to where I want her to go, which is having her spear broken and, and being my sex robot, and that's what I think having a submissive girlfriend is all about. And this is why even the very funny, superficial PUA stuff is dangerous because things like LMR get used like this. This is very clear evidence of how even a more basic version of this ideology that doesn't really go quite as deep into the misogyny all the time still ends up kind of getting rid of the notion of consent even mattering. Like he's like he, almost on the 
brink of awareness of like, are we the baddies? Like, am I psychologically abusing my partner? Am I getting close to that? Like, no, you passed it about, I don't know, the first time that she started wearing unwashed clothes to work. That probably was the point where we should have realized that this went too far. I just hope that for people reading this with me and, and hearing what I have to say, maybe you've gotten some more talking points to rebut against this. Maybe it's helped you recognize some things in past relationships, even current relationships that maybe aren't really sitting right with you. And trust your gut. This is why we have to be vigilant. This is why we have to be careful about letting pickup artists and red pillars and manosphere people into our spaces because they are adopting our language. They are getting very confused about DS and BDSM. They are passing on that confused knowledge to their very young fan bases. And I can only see this problem getting worse over time. I, I don't think this is going to go away anytime soon. I just think we have to be very aware. I know FetLife has had problems with people like this in the past. And if you see somebody spouting this ideology and they say they're kinky and to not kink shame them, sorry, sometimes you do got to kink shame. You're not welcome here. Don't, don't, you're not in my club. Leave. You're not allowed here. Get out. You're very, ugh, just, I want kink to be a place that is accepting and welcoming, and I do not want people like this to get a foothold. So be aware of how language is changing. If you guys have seen it, tell me about it. I want to know. Post about it. Call it out. That's everything I have to say about this. This, I thought, was just going to be a little funny Reddit react thing, and then it turned into a very serious video. I hope that you all got something out of it. If you want to see more lighthearted but educational videos from me, you can go ahead and subscribe because I make videos twice a week about all different topics related to kink and BDSM, fighting misinformation here on YouTube and elsewhere online. I would love to know your thoughts about this if you have any. And yeah, if you want to support what I do, you can join me over on Patreon. Link to that will be down below. If you do already support me over there, thank you so, so much. It means the absolute world to me. And until I see you next time, I hope you have a great rest of your day and a great rest of your week. Bye-bye.